Get a Book. Today presents Operation Wolfsbane, Book 4 in the Starship Expeditionary Fleet Series, by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2019. Stand by for a priority message from Skywatch Command. The Starship universe kicks off with Starships at War, my five novel series featuring the adventures of Captain Jason Hunter and the Bandit Jacks. Starship Expeditionary Fleet is the seven novella sequel story of the Battleship Argent and the build-up to the Second Praetorian Interstellar War. Destroy All Starships is series number three, when the Human Core Alliance of Worlds and the Dragons of the Starn Star Empire launch thousands of warships into a devastating conflict that will decide the future of the galaxy. Sixteen titles and more on the way. We're making it all available in ebooks, print books, and our all new audiobooks. No DRM, no apps, no compatibility issues, instant delivery, hours and hours of entertainment, car, home, gym, at the beach, anywhere, anytime, any device that can play audio can play my audiobooks, and nobody can beat my prices. All you have to do is remember one web address, shane.lachlan.black. That will take you to the Get a Book title of the day, where all our best deals can be found. It's continuously updated, so bookmark and visit often. All ahead, battle speed. Chapter 3 Lieutenant Colonel Lucas Moody was renowned for his reactions to treacherous enemy activity. He and his fellow officers had graduated from Skywatch Academy with stellar marks precisely because they all shared a set of important values. One of those was recognizing the fundamental difference between an enemy and an adversary. The Sarn landing party that had just gained easy access to the Triton base was most assuredly not classified in the latter category. Mu and the Proximan Lord Captain Gail Oakshot had taken up observation positions only a couple dozen yards behind and twenty feet above the southwest entrance to the heavy manufacturing facility. The Sarn entered the place like they had raised families there. Mu fumed. He knew there was more going on in and around Mycenae Seti 8 than met the eye. But he wasn't prepared for the fact a core alliance facility had been so casually invaded by a potentially dangerous enemy. The two Alliance officers had instructed their respective crews to remain behind so they could get an idea what was happening first. Then Mu had equipped himself with the necessary equipment to destroy the Triton base if necessary, including four satchel charges. Both human and feline knew they needed a plan, and a rather good one if they were going to prevail against a squad of heavily armed regular Sarn soldiers. While Oakshot was at least a physical match for the much taller reptilian enemies, Mu was at somewhat of a disadvantage, at least when it came to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Although the colonel was fairly muscular and heavier than an average marine, against a seven-foot bipedal reptile born to withstand the fury of an active volcano, he faced some profound limitations. Neither Mu nor Oakshot had rifles. The feline was armed with his sword, of course, which Mu had recently learned was somewhat more than a simple metal blade in the hands of a Proximan warrior. We've got to stop them! Mu growled. There's no telling what they are going to do if they get their hands on the equipment in there. Can they operate the communications array? Oakshot asked in a rumbling basso whisper. It's possible. If they can just walk through the perimeter security like that, I wouldn't be surprised if the whole place is compromised. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the so-called refugees we discovered weren't some kind of advance team left here to make sure the humans don't get control of this place again. That is a very interesting theory, Lukamu. I've been wondering about the story we've been told about why they were still here after all this time. The captain would caution me not to jump to conclusions, Mu replied, but the circumstantial evidence is starting to pile up. We've got to find a way to get in there. Come, let us see if there is a second entrance we can make use of. Oakshot moved quickly for a large humanoid cat, but he managed to make little noise as he descended the uneven grade to the canyon floor. The southwest wing of the Triton facility was surrounded on three sides by formidable gray rock walls that reached as much as 100 feet above the exterior metal decks. 
The central structure was less occluded by barriers, which was likely the reason it supported most of the base antennas and sensor equipment. Mu had noted the presence of a directional beacon assembly on the roof when they first landed. That meant at some point there had been some kind of orbital communications facility. If those birds were still in orbit, it would give the colonel a number of options, not the least of which was the possibility of establishing contact with the Descartes gate and getting a message either to the captain or Skywatch command. Somehow he had to alert his superiors to the fact a Sarn landing party was loose in a sensitive facility. What about the Bree Saw Yen? She is nearby on station. If we need support, I can always call in reinforcements, Oakshot replied. Good, because we're probably going to need them. Mu drew and activated his TK-12 heavy pistol. I'd rather not get a firefight started in here. The lizard in charge left at least four of those walking snakes back at the ship. They can call in reinforcements too, Oakshati replied. We must be cautious. Mu wasn't entirely sure what to expect from the towering humanoid cat. He had seen how Okshate's lieutenant carved up what must have been a Kraken scouting party with nothing but a piece of sharpened metal. He also considered himself fortunate to have been one of the first to see a Proximan turn aside energy weapon fire with the same sword. Mu was going to be telling stories about that little incident in every bar from Magellan to Antares the moment he got liberty. There was no telling what the Lord Captain had up his furry sleeve. By now, the entire Sarn landing party had moved inside the facility. Mu was hesitant, as it would be unusual for an experienced officer to lead an entire squad into a structure without posting at least one guard to make sure they weren't about to be ambushed. At the same time, the colonel wasn't about to wait around for his enemy to remedy his mistake. He moved quickly to the pressure hatch and peered through the transparent composite window. None of the Sarn soldiers were visible. The lights were still operating in all three of the chambers that were visible from the outer hatch. Mu slipped to the other side, and Oakshot moved up to the hatch controls. He deftly deactivated the seal and nodded to the colonel before opening the hatch. The portal slid aside soundlessly and the two allies slipped inside. The air inside the base was considerably cleaner and warmer than the planet's natural atmosphere. Mu glanced at the ceiling corners to verify the personnel systems were operating. Life support is still online. I would expect they will try to deactivate it at some point to make things tougher for anyone trying to retake the facility. Agreed. Are those the surveillance consoles? That they are. Mu and Oakshot across the outer chamber and activated the bank of monitors just inside the airlock control chamber. In moments, they were able to locate and evaluate the enemy squad. They had moved to one of the storage facilities not far from the central computer control facility. Why would they be snooping around in storage? Mu asked rhetorically. Oakshot ducked as a metallic sound echoed in a nearby passageway. By the time Mu reacted, a Sarn face was already visible in the door's port. The pressure mechanism activated and the huge reptilian alien stepped through. Oakshot's full weight slammed the creature into the nearest metal wall. A mighty struggle ensued. As the Sarn's hands ripped free, its weapon flew across the room. Oakshot planted and twisted his weight using his hip as a fulcrum. The Sarn stumbled back. A single shot from Mu's pistol struck it square in the back, and the heavy creature landed hard on the deck. Another sound echoed in the passage, and Oakshot drew his sword. Mu scarcely had time to react before the big feline confronted another Sarn fighter in the passage. A weapon fired and blasted sparks, smoke, and ozone into the airlock control. Oakshot's blade flashed as he sliced the air with it. A wedge of bright energy rocketed down the passageway and punched into the creature's chest. Its weapon slipped in its clawed hands as the scaled alien slumped into the corner. How can I learn to fire energy blasts from the edge of my sword? Okshati chuckled and patted the colonel's shoulder. I will train you, Lukamu. Perhaps you will learn better than your captain. Mu moved quickly to one sarn body while Okshati searched the other. The two officers discovered standard landing party equipment and at least one comlink. Perhaps we can use this to track them without the surveillance banks, Oakshot offered. That's an excellent idea, Lord Captain, but first we need to get to computer control. I want to know if they've gotten a message off this base. You're concerned about fresh troops? That and the fact they could be monitoring fleet operations here and beyond the Descartes gate. Remember, that world burner of theirs is in this system. The very last thing we want is for this place to end up being a spotter for that thing. 
If they have full control of the orbiting communication satellites, they could target any ship coming through the gate, Oakshot said. They'd be sitting ducks, Mu replied. The look on his face said it all. The two officers moved swiftly towards the nearest Cephalon console. Chapter 4 Captain Jocelyn Weiss had caught herself contemplating the seeming inevitability of historic events again. This time, she was standing on the Black Prince's observation deck, watching the magnificent gleaming profile of the heavy battleship Constitution as she settled into her place among the ships that would become her new battle group. Admiral Powers called it Task Force 9. That was the polite name for the formation. In reality, they were sharpening a sobering weapon. Constitution was to anchor a battle line of five cruisers, Fury, Saratoga, Montpelier, Black Prince, and Spruance. Although Francis Teller's ship was technically classified a light cruiser and Saratoga was essentially a missile platform rather than an assault ship, the fact was Rear Admiral Buford Tucker had just been handed more firepower than had been assembled in one place in ten years at least. Vice's command and the command of her fellow officer, Captain Heston Stone, had been originally deployed to screen for the Argent. Jason Hunter, being who he was, immediately detached the two ships to freelance in and around Rho Theta. It was a good thing he had shot from the hip on this particular occasion. If he hadn't, they would all still be in the dark about the fate of DSS Sussex and unaware that a third faction might be operating in an area sensitive enough to make Skywatch think twice about a potential strike on home soil. The truth was, five cruisers of the caliber Admiral Tucker had been dealt could pump out one hell of a lot of destructive power before the big fella called Constitution even got involved. Tucker's flagship was one of the old guard. She had six battle stars. While that didn't quite put her in a league with Song of Heaven, it certainly didn't hurt morale among her crew or her sister ships. The heavy battleship of Task Force 9 was first of her class. She mounted a 12-gun main battery organized into three turrets of four primaries. Unlike the newer variants, Constitution carried no missiles. This was one among many reasons she had been assigned the Saratoga as a heavy escort. Tucker's flagship specialized in old-fashioned blunt force trauma. Her guns were designed for short-range brass knuckles and pocket knife brawls. She was not a finesse weapon. Where more elegant and advanced ships might be rapiers, Constitution was a two-by-four. Her skipper preferred to inflict injuries consistent with expectations. Admiral Tucker the man lived up to roughly the same expectations as his ship. As a Skywatch command officer with a rather colorful and storied field record, Buford Tucker was well known for flying his own flag, both figuratively and literally. He was one of only a handful of line officers who had been busted more than once for insubordination. As a hot-headed young lieutenant, Tucker went a few rounds with his immediate report over fuel transfer regulations. Although a subsequent investigation vindicated the young officer, he was broken back to Ensign for six months as a reminder to follow the chain of command when logging potential deck safety violations. He rocketed through three subsequent promotions before calling a high-ranking supply officer a son of a bitch because he wouldn't approve additional maintenance on a water filtering system aboard the fuel transport where Tucker served as science officer. That remark cost him a month in the brig, but brought his record to the attention of one Benjamin Powers, who saw through the bluster and the big mouth to find a capable officer with what his comrades called a high-speed, low-drag approach. It wasn't long before Tucker found his way to the center chair and went on to become one of Southern Banner's most feared and accomplished skippers. Most of the command officers had already been briefed on what to expect. Vice made certain to pass along the relevant advice to her senior officers in case they were called upon to explain to the Admiral the events of the past few days. Vice made a point of counseling Commander Rogers to keep the technical terminology to a minimum so as to minimize the potential of a tirade in the middle of the Admiral's briefing. Getting the high points of the physics violating weapons across to everyone was going to be enough of a challenge without the histrionics and obligatory stories about raccoon hunts. Jocelyn Vice couldn't put her finger on it, but she had the nagging feeling there was a lot more going on in and near Rho Theta than they had uncovered so far. Whatever took out the Sussex was likely still nearby, and if that were true, they were getting valuable intelligence on Skywatch's buildup. The problem, at least from the captain's perspective, was that the Alliance wasn't getting anything in return. They had done a satisfactory job of establishing a spacehead and protecting the stations orbiting Rho Theta's innermost planets. But aside from those perfunctory achievements, they had almost nothing to go on when it came to the threat of an attack by a third enemy faction. 
Rho Theta was well enough defended for now, but even with a complete task force, the danger to the Missouri jump gate and the nearby Proximan listening post was significant. The longer they had to wait to get the information they needed, the worse it got. Bridge to Vice. Go ahead. Admiral Tucker is convening the strategy session aboard the Constitution, ma'am. Very well. Inform the Admiral we're on our way. Fifteen minutes later, Captain Vice wasn't the only officer surprised the briefing was not taking place on Constitution's war deck or in her spacious executive conference. The Admiral had invited his new command staff to join him in his quarters. Coffee and refreshments were served. Tucker made certain the relevant tactical and strategic star maps were adequately displayed on his brand new light table. The drink coasters were even transparent. Commander Hunter thought that was a nice touch. She made a mental note to look into a set for her own briefing room. Present were Captain Walsh of the Rhode Island, the Captain of Saratoga, and the skippers of the rest of Constitution's escorts, including the war destroyer Excalibur, the missile destroyer Myrmidon, the battle frigate Delos, and the electronic warfare frigate Circe. Rebecca Islington and her XO were also seated next to Commander Hunter. The division sergeant at the entrance to the Admiral's quarters quietly called the room to attention as Tucker entered. The man was as impressive in person as he was on paper. He dressed out at just over six foot four and a solid 240 pounds. Most men his age were a little soft around the middle, but the Admiral was in better shape than some ten years his junior. His face was worn with years and wisdom, but his eyes were as vibrant and attentive as one would expect. He wore his gray hair in a non-regulation ponytail and also wore a traditional tribal necklace given him by his late wife. He was a warrior of rare vintage, and he wasn't shy about speaking his mind or going nose to nose with what he often referred to as the sons of bitches. It was the Admiral's catch-all term for anyone who hadn't gotten with the Buford Tucker program. It wasn't entirely clear what the Tucker program was from day to day, as the Admiral reserved the right to alter his criteria for success at his own discretion. That said, if your career goal was to avoid becoming one of the sons of bitches, your top priority was to make sure you were fully briefed on today's requirements. He spoke slowly, running certain words together and freely substituting Z for S in a hard-to-predict pattern. His dialect was that of a gunmetal-tinged Tennessee gentleman. Be seated. The Admiral's Chief of Staff, Captain Gardea, took a seat beside him. Whatever you've heard about the buildup out here, forget it. Things are a lot worse than we originally thought. A bright-looking Marine corporal began handing out printed booklets that had been stapled together. The Admiral's opening statement set everyone on edge. Being handed printed documents only made things more confusing. The likely explanation for such an unusual step was the possibility of espionage. Paper documents were an unholy pain to get from one place to the next undetected. Electronic communications, on the other hand, were far simpler to intercept. Power's been a busy man, Tucker continued. Gardea highlighted the relevant portions of the map as he spoke. He's managed to get the ear of Commander Skywatch who put all of Eastern Banner on high alert this morning. Our recon pickets in and around Mycenae, Seti, and Galefos count 120 hostile starships with as many as 18 heavies mobilized. The Sarn have moved 60 divisions of Marines from the Galefos Rim to a line of space stations that have been deployed just outside the orbit of M. Seti 8. Turns out that's where the world burner ended up after that little show over M. C. D. 4. We lost two ships gathering the data, but we managed to confirm there are actually three world burners. Our recon probes estimate they displace 10 million tons each and have primary weapons no Skywatch vessel can withstand. Is it is possible they have more than three? Commander Hunter asked, alerting the rest of the ship captains to the most obvious threat. It is definitely possible, Tucker replied. We have some theories on how to engage the damn things, but I don't have to tell any of you I don't like going to war armed with a theory. The Admiral let the silence settle for a moment. Begging your pardon, sir, but is it an orbital assault weapon or can it engage targets in deep space? Stone asked. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it can lock targets given enough range, the Admiral replied. We haven't positively identified any weapons mounted on it that could qualify as point defense, and these ships only have the one primary. Their lighter vessels seem to be constructed on the same basic design, Captain Walsh said. The vessel we destroyed at Oleander Station was almost identical to the World Burner, just reduced in volume and relative power. Did Tropical 15 have other weapons mounts? Hunter asked. If it did, they never used them. No missiles either. 
Every shot fired came from their primary. That could be useful, sir, Hunter said. If the Kraken ship designs are all the same, and they rely exclusively on their primary weapon to engage enemy units, they could be vulnerable to missile attack. What about that, Commander? Tucker asked, directing his attention and the attention of everyone else at Walsh. We weren't as successful as I would have preferred, sir, Walsh replied. The Kraken warship we engaged was able to evade many of our birds. When we engaged with energy batteries, we had more luck, but we also had to be at extreme close range. We didn't have the tactical flexibility we normally get with Rhode Island's range and firing rate. I take it their landing parties were equally challenging? They're well-disciplined and they apparently have a variety of weapons which they freely swap out depending on the situation, Commander Islington replied. They also seem to be well able to adapt to using our weapons against us. Is that what you came across aboard the Sussex? Gardea asked. They employed some kind of water absorption effect on the crew, Vice replied. We're not sure if it is some kind of side effect of a different weapon or if it is caused by something else. What about the Sussex surveillance system? Burned to a crisp. Whatever their original motives, the Kraken boarding parties did a phenomenal job of covering their tracks, Vice said. And on the Proximan station? The same, Admiral, Islington replied. They spared the Proximan crew, but that may have been a result of our interrupting their plans before they were ready. There was only the one ship monitoring the station as well. Not enough capacity to do much except relay communications. Certainly not enough to establish a space head or a recovery zone, Islington replied. Ben, I want you, Islington, and Commander Walsh to spend some time together and go over all the telemetry from Rhode Island's two engagements. You too, Jace. If we run into one or more of those lighter Kraken variants, I want Fury and Saratoga ready to start nailing pelts to the side of the barn. All four captains acknowledged the Admiral. Jace was starting to wonder if Fury's fusion torpedoes might also be effective against such agile opponents. She remembered well the not-quite-optimal results achieved by deploying her Spectre batteries against the Psy Key. Captain Vice, I read your report on the recovery of the Sussex. I made sure to send my condolences to the families of those brave officers and crew. Would you be so kind as to bring us all up to date on the research you've conducted on her attackers? Commander Rogers took a breath to reply but hesitated when Vice placed a hand on his arm. We've concluded our preliminary analysis, sir, Vice replied. Our working theory is that a third alien faction is operating in Rho Theta space. Their weapon is unlike anything the Sarn or the Kraken have deployed. We're going to need more time to evaluate its strategic implications. For the time being, we should consider the residual effects potentially hazardous. It would help to know who fired it and from what ship, Stone added. I want you and Stone to brief the senior officers of the Wolf Pack and get them started on a search pattern in and around Rho Theta 3. While we're at it, I'd like to get Hunter's fighters to join in. If that unidentified ship is around here somewhere, I want him flushed out and strung up in time for supper. Sir, we have an advisory from Skywatch Command indicating a system-wide alert condition tomorrow morning at 0900, Captain Stone said. What should we be preparing for? d Corps is going to set down on Row Theta-4 to establish a heavy infantry base of operations. From there, they will be staging amphibious assaults into Mycenae Seti. They will also be reinforcing the automatic orbital station and establishing a failover communications array to link up with Oleander Station. That will get us prepared for the Proximans. The Proximans, sir? Hunter asked. If the Sarn have two allied forces backing them, we're going to need some backup of our own. The light table switched to a view of a rarely seen ship type. It was the Proximan Dreadnought Cuda. Oh my, Jay said under her breath. The vessel was as impressive as it was intimidating. The Proximans were not shy about building ships that reminded their enemies of claws and teeth. The Cuda was no different. She displaced more than three million tons and mounted an eight-gun main battery that wasn't quite as heavy as the Skywatch equivalent, but would definitely make her enemies think twice about getting too close. This is the little one, Tucker said. I've heard tell of a heavy dreadnought that's not far behind. His Majesty has called up his royal dragoons. They are some sword-swinging Hellcats, and they are going to give us some much-needed air cav support if we end up in theater-wide operations on the M-SETI planets. What kind of numbers? Captain Lewis asked. Fifteen divisions with two divisions of support staff and logistics. They are going to establish a base of operations on and in orbit over Rho Theta-4. 
His Majesty is sending all but the home fleet to garrison positions outside Prairie Grove and the Missouri Gate in order to give us a fallback in the event something or another pops up unexpectedly. His recon units will be operating in and around the Descartes Gate. Tucker's expression hardened. I don't have to explain to you all that we've been caught flat-footed here. That gaggle of bastards back at HQ left us with half our captains and about a third of our current generation hulls when they decided everything they surveyed was nothing but peace and safety for a thousand years. We are outgunned. We are outtunned. At best, we're looking at three to one against in ships and two to one against in men under arms. We're a month behind in supply lines and two months behind in logistics. If we survive this, and that is by no means a foregone conclusion, we will lose planets and we may lose a system or two. We're going to have a lot of casualties, and most of the boys on the way here right now aren't going home. There are also 10 billion civilians caught in the crossfire. It was what they needed to hear. None of the assembled officers wanted to hear it, but the admiral knew how to spell it out for his troops. But we're Skywatch, and that means we're going to unleash nine kinds of hell before this is over, and God help whoever or whatever gets in our way.